Welcome back to TarHeelIllustrated.com. And if you are watching us on our rapidly growing YouTube channel, that is called Tar Heel Illustrated. I'm THI publisher Andrew Jones, and joining me as our director of basketball recruiting and analyst, longtime college AAU and high school coach David Sisk. And we are back for another podcast previewing North Carolina's 2022-23 basketball season. The top-ranked Tar Heels tip off November 7th at home against UNC Wilmington. I am looking forward to this season because I think there are a ton of storylines, David. And one of the storylines heading into every season are is which freshmen are going to step forward and become a part of the rotation and help the team out. I actually think it's a more interesting discussion with this group because four starters are back and they brought in an automatic starter from somewhere else, a guy from the Big Ten who started there. So the starting five is there. It's solid. Then you have bench guys like Puff Johnson, who's been in the program for a while. You have dudes who got opportunities and came through in the postseason last year, like Don Trish Styles. Justin McCoy is a fourth year college player who started some at UVA. And then you got DeMarco Dunn, who started in the exhibition game. So where does that put guys? Where does that leave guys like Seth Trimble, Tyler Nickel, Jalen Washington? And Will Shaver, and we are including Will Shaver in this podcast, even though he arrived last winter, he did not play. He just worked out and he is listed as a red shirt freshman for the Tar Heels this year. So we're going to hit on these four guys, David. You start with whatever one you want to talk about. And we'll go from there. Well, I do think it's going to be interesting because um, you've got such a deep roster and, you know, when you've got a starting lineup that was called the Iron Five and everybody's back except one and the guy you bring in to replace him is a 20-year-old fifth-year senior who averaged 15 points a game in the Big Ten, uh, you know, it, it's not like they, they got to have you. So, you know, it's not as – you'll have some programs – where freshmen have got to come in right away. Um, I would look at maybe like a Wake Forest when Steve Forbes got there, that kind of situation. Jeff Capel, Pitt, some of those where it was a total, total rebuild. You know, that this is not the situation for Hubert Davis in his second year. So he has that luxury. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see. I think up front – the most playing time opportunity may be for Seth Trimble uh, simply because, and we addressed this in, in the podcast with the reserves, uh, there's more room in the backcourt for playing time. And there's more of a log jam in the front court. So, you know, so he has already kind of uh, set himself apart with his athleticism. Yeah. You told me before we started about an hour ago, that everything that we said about Seth Trimble was right, and you wouldn't tell me why. You said <laughs> in the podcast, I've not forgot that. So I want to hear what you say about that. But the first guy that I would probably look at that I would want to discuss, because like I said, and it turned out in the rivals rankings of those four freshmen, he was the, ended up being the highest ranked, highest rated player in the 2022 class. But like I said, I think he can come in spell time with Caleb Love and R.J. Davis. He can play a combo. So when one rests, he can come in and kind of either or play the one or the two. So, But I'm interested to hear your take on I've been waiting on this for an hour. <laughs> probably a little more than an hour. Uh, Jalen Washington, by the way, if he wouldn't have gotten had the knee injury, he probably would have finished yeah. in the top 30 as well. He was yeah. there before the injury. He was before a five-star one time. Yeah. Before, yeah. 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 before I answer the question, let me, let me comment on one thing that you were hitting on a few minutes ago. I think if they brought in a fresh, uh, if they brought in a freshman class of you, me, Gerard Hardy, and Miss Kang, this would still be the number one team in the country. They would still be a, a, they could still win a national title without ever playing any freshman. 
because they have enough parts there. So that kind of speaks to what you're saying, that they are already a really good team. So what do they get from these guys that can help make them maybe a little bit better team? I think Trimble is the obvious one because he is a more talented kid at this stage than the other ones. He's more ready. He looked like a, a, a blue blood college basketball player in the exhibition. Now, granted it was an exhibition against division two team. That was not very good, but I look and see how a guy plays with his teammates. That's one of the reasons I love those early games. How do they, do they look like they belong? Remember what I said about DeMarco Dunn? Well, like it took him a few minutes to really kind of get into it. And then he looked a lot more comfortable. Tremble looked comfortable the minute he stepped on the court and he displayed the athletic ability, the bounce and something that he showed that I didn't know he had, David, I guess maybe we didn't discuss this so much. You did talk about his ability to drive and we saw that, but he used the baseline several times and he got a couple of assists driving the right baseline. And that immediately made me think, and I want to throw this at you because uh, I'm going to agree with everything you said about him before the, the, the perimeter shooting is not there yet, but everything else is there's a mid range floater type game and there's a go right to the rim game in him, but the baseline drives a lot of, combo guards point guards if you will are not super comfortable playing wing to the baseline he is so that tells me he could act if hubert wants to run a three guard lineup with rj caleb and seth trimble on the floor because of whatever situation that they're in or if he just wants to give it a look and you have one of those guards that's comfortable on the baseline that's a great that's a great thing because that allows him to keep spread out that keeps them from kind of clanking and they can mesh together well. So I see Trimble as a guy having more than just the, the someone who fills in for Caleb, some fills in for RJ, some. I can see at some point down the road, perhaps a little bit of three guard stuff because he brings so much to the floor. And that would be an offensive lineup because he can attack out of that. So you've got more space. You're playing around a big, so you kind of think about three guard. And, and a lot of people say, okay, three guards around two bigs. Well, it's not going to be three guards around two bigs. It's probably going to be Pete Nance, you know, with the four, or a Puff Johnson, somebody who can spread the floor out and play behind the three-point line. So, you know. Um, That's a driving lineup. If you have those three guards out there with Puff as your four and Nance at the five, for example, that's a driving lineup. That's you can hit some threes, but you got dudes that can attack the rim from all these different spots on the floor there. Yeah. And I still think they would do it with a four out. Um, I asked Nate Oates one time at an, at an AAU tournament last summer. I always enjoy talking to him. And I, I, I'm kind of just, just intrigued with what he does offensively. And he, he, he's always said that he had, he liked the four out better than the five out. And, and his teams, you either shoot layups or you shoot threes. And I asked him why. And he said, you've got more space in the four out. And I never really thought about it because you think if you lift yeah. everybody, you've got five guys outside the three-point line, then you've got even more space. But he says, no, that cuts down on your driving lanes. You've got less space to defend uh, around the perimeter. So – I think if you do that, like you say, then you would slide Nance down on the opposite block or the dunker spot yeah. in the corner or whatever. But yeah, no, I mean, there's there's there, there's a word that we've not used a lot with North Carolina uh, with what they had left because you knew what you had last year with that group. You know, RJ was the point, Caleb was the two, uh, Leaky was the three, uh, you know, Baycock was the five. And, and then obviously you had Brady Manick at the four. They had defined spots. It's traditional. It wasn't positionless like a lot of teams play now. So we never used the word versatility a lot. So Seth Trimble now is is one of the the players who may bring more versatility than anybody else on his team. Now we got some others we talked about could play the three four, and it's kind of some guys coming off the bench. Could be a Don Trez, could be a uh, uh, Puff Johnson Puff. that that could play either spots. Maybe even end up being a Tyler Nickel, who we'll talk about here in a minute. But guys who can play multiple positions and could defend multiple positions. We talk about them offensively. I would expect that Seth Trimble would be able to guard the one through the three very easily. And if you play small ball, you 
maybe even be able to guard the four if they're playing the small ball. A lot of these guys like the teams like to run a four at about six six, you know. And I would suspect if it's a quick six six, he can guard that guy. So uh, you know, you're going to have a guy who can play one, two, three spots, maybe one through to three offensively, and can guard three to four spots. We've always heard you are who you defend. You can defend. If you're a spot, yeah. Yeah. if you're a point guard and you say, well, I play one through three and you can't guard the three, you're not a three. So, um, you know, but like I said, a lot of versatility is, is the thing that I'm going to be looking at that he brings. And he's still growing, isn't he? I mean, he's a young kid. He's he's a little younger than a true freshman would be at this stage. And I know that you talk to a lot of the people around him and that I believe his AAU coach believes that he may grow a couple more years, right? Right. Right, yeah. So, that, so he's he's a long 6'3 right now. And to me, he looks a little longer than that on the court. He could be a guy that ends up playing at 6'5". Yeah, and then you've got a whole new ball game, and you've got a bigger guard. But like I said, he's able to do that. And then you look, that's on down the road. And then you look some of the guys that they bring in and, and maybe what you already had. If he could do that, slides over to three. You know, DeMarco Dunn would probably like that. <laughs> and and you know, that's less competition in the backcourt. And then you've got Wilcher coming in. And then, you know, you, you're, they're really looking hard at, at Elliot Cadu, who's a, a possible reclass. So, um, you know, you've got uh, – he he's going to be in a mix to the way it goes, not only this year but on down yeah. the road because I think he's going to be able to – you can look at him at a number of different spots and, and a number of different positions. Well, what he does now already, and I guarantee you that Hubert trusts him in with these these three things that are very important. He can run an offense. He can run a team. He, and with that, he can see the floor. He, he can find open guys. No doubt about that. He's a guy that's going to get a lot of assists, and he can defend. When you ask his teammates, I ask Caleb about him. I ask RJ, Armando, Hubert. The first thing that comes out of their mouth is lockdown defender. So you've got a bouncy athletic guy who is a lockdown defender. That tells me that he could be a dude that ends up getting a lot of steals that lead to transition baskets. I imagine he's incredible in the open court. It probably plays right into his skill set. So he's a guy that can bring energy on both ends of the floor, not just the offensive side. He could do that defensively as well. I think that's intriguing because if you're going to insert someone off the bench to fill in for RJ at the one, or maybe to play the or, or maybe to play the one sometimes when Caleb goes out and RJ slides over to the two. If that guy brings a lot of energy and he can run an offense and find open teammates, but also make things happen on the defensive end on the point, I think that that is huge. Not a lot of teams get that off the bench and I, and project out, David, him doing that for three or four months. And then you start heading into the February in the postseason, he could be a real weapon and perhaps a sixth or seventh man for this team. You know, you talk about energy, uh, and while you're talking, my mind starts racing when you bring up a certain phrase or a certain subject, and I start thinking about stuff. Um, so, Hubert, going into this class, you know, you, you look originally, you had Don Trez and DeMarco Dunn in his first class, and then you've got the four players you mentioned here. So those six players at a high school, it would be close. I've either I've talked to all six numerous times, interviewed all six. Jalen Washington was was very was always really really easy to work, easy to get in touch with. He would be a close second, but Seth Trimble is one of the easiest guys. And I've been now since 2015, and I've done, I run about. 400 stories a year. So I've probably done 2,000 recruiting interviews since I've started at Rivals. He's one of probably one of my favorite two or three going back into high school because, man, if you send him a text, he answered. If it's like, if it was at midnight, hey, man, how'd you do tonight? Call, call me. Call and, and, and he'd, he'd talk. Man, let's set up a story. Let's do an interview. Man, he, he was full of phrases. He was great to talk to. He was articulate. He was outgoing, but he's bubbly, energetic. I don't know if you've got to talk to him yet, uh, but very, very, but he's going to be great. You'll enjoy it, but very bubbly, Looking very energetic. So he's, that's his natural personality. So I can see him taking that personality onto the floor 
I, I wouldn't expect anything less when he played. So I could just I can just see him being just this dynamo when he gets out there. The crowd, the fans are gonna love him. The way he plays, his personality, all that. It's something that's it's really gonna resonate. You could tell that there was a little little buzz when he had the ball in his hands in the even in the exhibition game. Let's move on to Tyler Nickel. Six seven sharpshooter, an all-time leading scorer in prep prep score in Virginia history, and that's a state that has produced a ton of big time players and great scorers. I had a chance to finally see him. It's interesting. Uh, Jacob Turner on our site saw him at a at a camp last spring, last May, I think it was, and interviewed him. Uh, I think it was that in May and, and had some interesting things to say about him. Uh, so then when I talked to the, some of his teammates that I'm asking about him, I remember hearing about, boy, you know, he's a different kind of dude. He's, he's got a lot of, uh, he's got a lot of um, swag, uh, swag in his game. He's, 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 he's a very competitive guy. He's a fist pumping guy. He's a dude that wants to put you out kind of thing. There, there's a lot, high degree of competitiveness. So how does a guy like that, who's in rural Virginia, Shenandoah Valley, Harrisonburg. How does it, Harrisburg, how does a guy like that translate to walking into North Carolina? And I thought it was really interesting watching him in that game the other night because I saw exactly what his teammates were saying. I saw a guy who was extremely confident, unbelievably confident. And you could tell he knows he's an assassin type shooter, but the thing that I was really impressed with David, he didn't try to show the world. He was that guy. He played within everything with his teammates. Yeah. He blended very, very well. And it wasn't because he was deferring. It's because he was playing basketball. So he's not just shooter. He's a basketball player. And I really appreciated that in his game. And I go back to what Caleb said when he was asked about, Tyler Nickel. And the first thing he said, the first thing that came out of his mouth was he's a dog. And if you've been around college athletes long enough, when a kid who's new is, is asked about to a veteran, someone says, okay, you're a veteran. I'm asking you about this newcomer. We don't know anything about him. And the first thing that comes out of his mouth is he's a dog. To me, that's the highest compliment a new player, a freshman player can be paid by a veteran player who's very accomplished. And what's interesting is that's what other guys are saying. So we got to see a little bit of dog out there because there was a situation in front of the Johnson C. Smith bench where there was a potential squabble. Tyler Nickel comes running from the other side of the floor and he's right there to be there for his teammate. But just the, the game that's there, there's a lot of stuff there, David. I don't know how much of it we're going to see on a regular basis this year, probably not too much. But there's a guy that I think is going to help this program over the years. I think the fans are going to love him because they love dudes that can shoot. And when Hubert was asked about him after the exhibition game, he was giving all these plaudits and putting off and saying, yeah, and you know what? He can really, really shoot. I mean, he can really shoot. And I like that. I like that a lot. So Tyler Nichols going to help this basketball team one way or another. You know, and, and look, I, I think when you when you look at Tyler Nichols and some things I've seen so far, and I go back to when I saw him playing with Team Loaded on the Adidas circuit. Um, you you there he's got there's these stereotypes, and we might as well get it out of the way. You take a white kid from rural Virginia. And everybody thinks he's a catch and shoot guy, you know, and that's it. Catch and shoot guy scores a ton of points. Well, you're not playing against competition. Uh, you know, if he scores an ACC level, he's going to have to be wide open. Somebody's going to have to trade. They throw to him and he catches shoot. And that was not what I saw in the AU because that's a, this is a very athletic, uh, highly competitive level of play against a high major, a ton of high major players. When I saw him, he didn't shoot the ball that well from the outside. So I saw him when, um, you know, he – he. I think the games I saw, a couple of games, I don't know if he ever got the double figures. But he was really effective because the first thing I noticed was, well, number one, he can move at his size. Yeah. He's He's got a good body. I said, I looked at him. I said, he is going to be plenty strong enough and physical enough to play in the ACC. This is not some 
bean pole they're going to just knock around out there on the floor. He he he's got a he's got that a, a, he, to me he had a high major level body, and he could put the ball on the floor well. I thought he defended well. I thought he was a good defender. Uh, he was verbal. He communicated. He checked a whole lot of boxes. So, you know, when I saw that, I'm like, you know, I'm look. The whole thing I'm looking at is, well, how well does he shoot the ball? <laughs> and, and and that's my question because to me, he did a lot of that other stuff that people would stereotype and probably think he doesn't do. Yeah. So, and then last year. Of course, like you say, he was kind of tucked away. And uh, now there was one thing about it, him and that whole circle around him, and, and they admittedly, they didn't like to do, they didn't like to do interviews. They didn't like yeah. all the attention. They even didn't the let anybody school, in. They didn't the, let anybody in. The high school coach and even and all that stuff just told me, says, look, I don't want to bring attention. Can you talk to me about, you know, I just don't like to bring attention to myself. And and yeah. so you got a lot of that. And that's okay. So but I start hearing word that, you know, he's six, seven to six, eight. now, And I remember thinking if he is that tall, it's a game changer because I think he's much more effective if he can go, because you got to remember when I saw him, he was about six, five. So they're thinking the two to three. And I said, well, you know, I think he can play the three. No, two, you really – you're talking about guarding guys like Caleb Love at the two. That's a whole – that's a different ball game. But he's more effective as a three. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, if he could get up to about six, seven, six, eight and play that four spot, man, you're, you you could be talking about something here. So I start hearing, hey, he's six, eight. So I know you said six, seven right in that range. Yeah, so six, seven, six, eight I, is – I'm right. They list him at six, seven. So I'm going to go with what they list him at. But I've heard some, you know, from a few birdies that he's probably more like six, eight. And they think he has the potential to be a four at some See, point. That's the thing. And you say, okay, you're talking, David, you're talking out of both sides of your mouth here because you said a while ago he was <laughs> plenty physical enough and athletic enough. And now you're saying, but he's going to be better off if he's not guarding the two. Now, which one is it? What I'm saying is he had that strong physical frame, which moved pretty well. And I'm looking at him probably at about the three and saying, you know, he, 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 he can compete there. He can compete, but man, if he could get to the size where he can play a four, we're talking about a guy instead of competing that could really take off. So when I look at him and what he can do with his skill set and already a strong physical frame, can shoot the ball, and now you play at a four, and all of a sudden he turns into a guy that probably has a little bit of a quickness advantage on some fours. So yeah. I am very, very interested to see how this package goes. One thing I noticed when you had the blue and white scrimmages, you know, he had a game. I think he scored 16 or something like that, and people were really getting excited about that. He made some shots. I'm kind of showing them. They were some shots with a high degree of difficulty. So he's going by a guy, or not necessarily by a guy, but he's going from a wing. He's pulling up at that high post, and he's making a tough jump shot off the dribble with a guy hanging all over him. And you look at him and you say, what's well, a nice shot? But they were contested. So, you know, I want to see him keep working on that part of his game where he's putting the ball on the floor and he can start creating. I think that's the, the step for him offensively, and I don't know this. I'm not around it every day. I may be totally full of crap here, <laughs> Andrew. I mean, he may have already mastered this, but what, what I saw in that, even though he scored well, I want to see a guy who can take it when it does come his time that can create space because we know yeah. he can score. College game's a little bit different. ACC's a little bit different or a whole lot different. Now he can take that dribble and man, it, it, and he can create a shot for him with a guy up in. He can step back. He can put his shoulder into him. He's able to get free from this guy, even when he's in him, and get where he's got a window about like that, and he can get that shot off instead of that guy's hand right here in his face. So that's got to be the next thing, man. But it looks to me like the tools are there. 
Yeah, this isn't creating space, but uh, it's sort of related in the sense that finding space is a skill for a guy who's a perimeter player in a, sh- in a shooter, especially against the zone. And one of the, and Johnson C. Smith ran nothing but two, three. And I thought it was interesting that Tyler always looked comfortable finding soft spots in that zone. He didn't always shoot from it. He only took the four shots in about 16, 17 minutes, but he found the soft spots. Uh, there's just a flow, sort of a recognition part of his game. I thought that that was something I didn't know to what to expect. And again, it was Johnson C. Smith, but you can still see if a guy's got certain attributes like that. And they were certainly on display. I'm going to go to Will Shaver next before we do Jalen Washington. Will Shaver arrived last winter. I got to see him work out some after games. He was working on basic, literally the basics. If you want to relate it to baseball, it's like, you know, a lot of guys will work hitting off a tee. They work on a lot of things when hitting off a tee. That's where he was with working on his skill step, drop stuff, spin moves, just squaring to the basket, fingertips, all those kind of things. There was a, they broke his game down literally and we're building it back up. So what did I see the other night? What have I heard from some people about him? What I saw was a guy that has got, Still got some time to go, and he has time. He's he, he's got four he's four seasons at North Carolina. Become whatever he's going to become before he moves on. He's a big dude. He's really big. He's six ten. He's two sixty. He looks like he moves okay. Um, I'd like to see him more in a in a in a, in a ninety four feet situation. I, when I think of North Carolina bigs, the, pref, the preference for years of the Tyler Zellers who could beat guards from one baseline to the, to the other baseline. Shaver's not going to win any of those races right now, but I think he's a guy that continues to work on things and will get quicker in that sense. But um, David, he's a space eater. He's a guy that can rebound. He he blocked a shot, I believe. He looked like he anticipated well, and the skill work is is an ongoing thing. Now, before you comment on him, I, I, I asked Hubert about Pete Nance a couple of weeks ago, and I was talking more about what Pete does defensively, where he can back up an Armando. You know, we, we've talked a lot about the national championship game last year when Armando went out, Manic went in, and David McCormick got the ball, turned and scored on a shot he's probably taken 50,000 times in his life. He knew exactly where he was. You want a guy that might be able to move him out a little further to raise the degree of difficulty on that shot. So I was asking a question about that with respect to Pete Nance. Hubert said what he said about Nance, and then went to Will Shaver. Said, Will can do that. Will's a guy that could do those things. So that tells me that if they're in a situation where they need to play him, they could trust him to defend. They could trust him to move a guy off the blocks. He's going to get some rebounds, and maybe he can alter some shots with his length and with his midsection by pushing a guy out. If that's where he is right now, and that's it, and everything is still to come down the road, then I think there will be moments where he can help this team. He's a yeah, he was a top 150 player in high school. And I and I think I tell you what happens a lot of times. A guy can be ranked, let's say, number 145. And I'm just not saying this about rivals. I'm saying this about anybody. A guy can be ranked number 145. He can commit to North Carolina or Kentucky or Kansas or somebody. And then the next rankings come out Friday and he's gonna be number 60. Because he, and you've seen it in football. Yeah, absolutely. These, these three stars that Alabama get in football that nobody's ever heard of, including Saban signs them. Next thing you know, they're five stars and they're top 100 players. So, you know, that happens. And that, we're just talking about <laughs> failure. So, you know, but he, when I looked at him out of high school, okay, he was a legit, I, I'm going to say a three-star post. You looked at him, you say, this is a big kid. That's, you can't teach that. That's the first thing. And he had some skill. I I watched him right after he had committed, or right before. I know North Carolina had offered, and they were heavily in the mix. I'm trying to remember if it was before or after. But it was July of 2020. It was right after. It was a month after because he committed in um, early June. Well, it would have been June. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. You saw, you saw him in Birmingham, right? Saw him. No, I saw him in Under Armour in Cartersville, Georgia. Georgia. So, okay. That's right. Yeah. And the one thing I saw, he was a big kid, but they were playing him outside a lot. I mean, they were really trying to pick and pop him and 
you know, he wasn't rolling off. He set a lot of ball screens. He wasn't rolling. He was popping and stay out there. And he's trying to dribble to the mid range and shoot 15, 17 footers off a pull up. And, you know, and, but it's and it really, it was obvious he wasn't a stretch guy. So I, it was just hard to take anything away from it. He's got quicker guys in him. So he's trying to handle the ball on him and he's losing the ball some. So you're, you're kind of saying, hold on. But in fairness, it wasn't, you, 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 he wasn't playing to where he's going to be playing that color, where you think he ought to be playing out on the floor. So I went, there was a lot of different guys there. You remember they were recruiting Isaac Trout and there were several other yeah. guys that they were recruiting and I was going to go watch them. Play. I was watching them play. Well, I had a buddy who was at Jacksonville state assistant coach and, uh, I went over to another floor and I came back at halftime and I said, well, I'll just catch him in the second half. And he said, well, and you missed it. He had 18 in the first half. <laughs> like, what? And, uh, and it was against one of the better teams. And I thought it was just, it was one of the best teams that the Under Armour had. So, you know, he told me, he said, he just looked much more comfortable. He, he, he was more in the post. He was more in the mid range. He wasn't outside as much. Uh, so, you know, so when you look at him, you uh, you could see it with the size. And you had good soft hands, had decent feet. He's not overly athletic. He's not going to play over the rim. But he's a strong kid, like you were talking about. He's got size. Yeah. That's something you can't coat. So he's got that going for you. So I was going to say, you know, he was probably a, I would I would say a three star, high three star, close to four. But I remember asking the North Carolina fans. I brought this up before. They'll know this name, Bob Gibbons. And I knew Bob well in the nineties, Bob was a UNC guy, you know, really close to Dean Smith and Bill Guthridge and Lloyd Williams and all those. And I remember uh, asking him, I spent a lot of time with him back in the nineties. And I remember asking him, I was a young guy, what's a five star, what's a four star, what's a, what's the difference? And he said, you go to a class of five, a, a one star might play that senior year. You know, a two-star definitely will. A three-star, maybe by the end of their sophomore year, that junior year, but you're definitely going to get two good years out of them. So I kind of look at that, and, you know, with a red shirt and everything, he gets another year. So I think you're looking at him on down the road as a guy that Hubert Davis is counting on at that five spot, maybe as a red shirt sophomore or a, a uh, you know, when I'm talking about third year. Uh, yeah. really being able to start to get some time and some reps because I'm going to tell you, I come from the, the school of, and Roy think Roy was that way. You think about the first year I covered. I mean, do you think about all the posts they had two years ago? They had four, they had four, yeah. basically seven footers. that could all play. Roy believed it. Dean believed it. You could never have enough bodies in there, man. You give them five fouls, you just pound on people. You rebound, you draw fouls, you foul, you, you just, you, you, you just, you just beat them down in there. So he's a guy you can never have enough size. And that's the thing he brings. He is big and he is strong. Yeah. He also has a tremendous work ethic. That's the other thing that I've heard. And, and, that's kind of synonymous with what a guy like that needs to have if he's going to have a chance to make it because he just doesn't have the uh, skills and talent just oozing from his pores, from his basketball pores. Uh, so what's interesting is I go back to seeing him work on that basic stuff last year. Remember last year was still a COVID year in basketball for the media. We weren't allowed in the press room yet. None of that was open. So everything we had to do after the game, we had to do from our media seats where we actually watched the game. So players would come in and work out and do some stuff. Now he was always out there. And it was really interesting. It was almost like watching beginning basketball. But I like stuff like that because here's a guy that they were just going to they, they had this canvas. They said, okay, we're going to recreate this canvas and it's going to look pretty good. But it's going to take a while. You got to be patient with it. You got to be patient as we unveil this thing over the course of time. And that's what I think is really interesting about him. What you just said about late sophomore year. Yeah, that'd be pretty interesting. 
You know, it'd be pretty neat to see a guy get to a point where maybe he's thrust into it. Because if they, they're they going to lose uh, Nance, they're more than likely going to lose Armando. I know people like to joke or like to say he's going to come back for a fifth year. I don't see that happening. So there might be a, a situation next year where uh, Will Shaver's going to have to help. He's going to need some minutes, though, this year to get on the floor and experience some things so he is better positioned to help next year. Because what I was saying about some of the guys in the, the returning reserves podcast, you need to have game confidence. You need to be able to see things in games and, and understand the speed and how everything is just slightly different there than it is in practice. And then a guy with a great work ethic like him can apply that to getting better. He has a lot more knowledge about where his game is and where it needs to go. Well, you know, if he can get a few minutes, let's say against UNC Wilmington, I have to believe after banging around Armando Baycott every day since January, <laughs> the last 10 months, whoever UNC Wilmington throws at him has got to be, has got to be, the game would have to slow down for him, you know, compared to going up against Baycott. So he's getting yeah, no a doctor. He's getting a doctor in post play right now in every practice and in every yeah. pickup game. So, uh, man, you, you you could – it's there, the player development, the op, everything he's got around him to, to make him a better player, to develop him uh, uh, player development-wise is there. And, uh, you know, I, I, hopefully he'll take advantage of that because, like I said, he has got – you just don't have guys 6'10", 6'11", 260 – who's got good feet and good hands walk through those yeah. doors all the time. So, yeah, you know, exactly. he's got, got, you know, he, he, he's won the DNA lottery. There's no doubt about that. So, you know, I, I think on down the road, people don't think a lot about him right now, but I think he's got the opportunity. They're going to be patient with him. And as long as he's patient with the situation, with the process as well, it could work out very, very well for both parties. Jalen Washington was at one point the highest rated kid among these four, but he had the knee injury around the time when you saw him and talk with them face to face for the first time. I think it was around that same weekend you, you uh, were talking about Will Shaver as well. Uh, Jalen Washington is a guy that is highly skilled. Hubert Davis is, I think you mentioned in a previous podcast, he said he's got one of the best shots he's ever seen from a, from a, from a six, nine type guy along the baseline, 12 footer, 15 footer. He's got a lot of skill to his game when he's fully hundred percent. There's some bounce there. There's some IQ in his game. There's a lot of stuff that he does well. And he's a very intriguing prospect. He dropped in the rankings because of the knee injury and he did not play his senior year where he stands right now. We're recording this, what, six nights before the opener is that he had, he was cleared in late September to do five on five stuff and full speed, but they're bringing him along real slowly, David. They don't have a need to rush because they don't need him to be the team they're going to become this year. He doesn't have to get out there and play in November because they're desperate for a four or someone that can play some of the five. They're not in that position. So they have the luxury of bringing him along slowly, easing him into some stuff. He's done some five on five, but the last time we talked to Hubert, which was after the exhibition game, he hadn't done a ton of it. And so Hubert said, yeah, he'll probably be ready for the opener, but maybe, maybe not. I, I think this is going to be a slow process with him. And anybody expecting Jalen Washington to get a lot of minutes early probably are going to be a little bit disappointed, but I wouldn't read anything into it. They want to make sure this young man is healthy. They want to make sure that when he does get out there and he's, and he's playing in a competitive game, that he's full 100% confident and ready to roll. And they don't need that from him right now. He's got a very, very bright future. They're aware of that. They've articulated that to him. So we're just talking about patience with Will Shaver. I think patience is also one of the narratives with Jalen Washington. You know, it almost sounds, I don't think they did podcast in 1982, but it almost sounds like you and I are doing a Nebraska football podcast from 1982, where you bring in some guy, they red shirt everybody. Where'd you pull that from? <laughs> well, I'm just thinking about it. You, they red shirt everybody. They bring them in, and 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 they hide some guy for two or three years that you never heard of. Of course, you've heard of these guys, but they put them in the lab for two or three years. <laughs> they develop them, and the next thing you know, you've got some you've got some farm boy. It's an all American. You know, 
by the time he's a junior or senior. And yeah. at North Carolina, you, we keep and, and where I pulled it out at is we're talking about all these guys developing. And I guess the two words that come to my mind right now with these guys, and Hubert has that luxury right now, is developmental program. And I think Dean Smith, we, Dean Smith did this all the time. Everybody that we mentioned, we're talking about developmental. We're talking about Tyler, maybe not as much with, with Trimble, but we've still talked about Trimble developing his jump shot and, 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 and picking up that part of his game. But you look at Nickel, you know, you, you look at Shaver. And now, and Washington's more injury related than anything. But like you say, they don't have to push him. I think that's good for him. I'll be honest with you. I would be very nervous about him right now if he was in at a program where they did need him because he, you know, he'd, he'd had an injury in between his junior and his senior year and or late in his junior year. So he didn't play any AAU. I saw him in Birmingham, a uh, July uh, between his junior and his senior year. Uh, he uh, stayed in Birmingham an extra night just to get to see. I did get a good interview with him, but I stayed in Birmingham an extra night, left Adidas, went downtown Birmingham. That's a story in itself. And over to see him and he didn't dress. He had that knee injury. They wanted to save him uh, for Peach Jam. He didn't play for much of Peach Jam. And then Mean Streets gets all the way to the Final Four. Bradley Bill lead on Saturday in the Final Four. He played. That game was on ESPNU. He had a big game. He had like 16 points. Played really well. Uh, but you could tell he was a little rusty. Wasn't – you're talking about a guy – as a sophomore, early junior was top 20, 25, was borderline five-star. I mean, he 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 was – we're talking about a legit, legit, legit big-time prospect. And so he had that knee injury. He's reco recovering from that. And then after Peach Jam, the next month, he goes to – well, might have been later in July. It may have just been two or three weeks after that. Goes to NBPA top 100 camp and uh, blows his knee out again. Yeah. Right after that, didn't play at all his senior year. So you're talking about a guy that basically in the last, gosh, 18 months has played very, 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 very little. And so there's a reason there was a drop in rankings, but it's not an indictment on him. Yeah. Don't get mad that anybody does the rankings. Don't panic about him. If he'd have been playing, he'd have been healthy. He's top 25 player. Uh, the thing with him, obviously getting rid of the rust, you know, and it's going to take time. You take a guy that's not played a competitive get basketball that long, it's going to take mm -hmm. time. I, you do have con some concerns with reoccurring knee injuries that they don't keep happening. That's the thing. But here's the good thing. They don't have to push. So every day that – he can get to where he doesn't have to be in that situation to re-injure that knee gets stronger. You do therapy, you've got all this training, you've got all this physical therapy, you've got all that. He can strengthen. And, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, you know, that could stretch out another year where he's just developing, you know, he's getting that knee stronger, and then he's ready to go. Now, once he does, like I said, there's going to be rust to get off, but I'm – I think – I mean, if he shoots the ball the way Hubert says he can shoot it, yeah. I just pray to God he, he stays healthy because he could do a lot of good things. Yeah. If, if he never would have had the injury, he'd be a guy that would definitely help them a lot oh, yeah. right Absolutely. out of the game. Absolutely. And he may end up helping them a lot down the road. It's just really hard to gauge right now as we try to project forward – where he's going to slide in at some point this season. And again, you're, you talking, you're yeah. talking about, you're talking about a log jam with a lot of the, you know, the fours and fives. So um, there may not be uh, much of an opportunity there this year, especially for a guy that they're, they're going to take, uh, bring along slowly. If he had not been injured, he is a guy that probably goes and starts as a freshman from day one at 90 to 95% of the, 
programs in Division One basketball, and 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 I'm t- I'm talking high major. Yeah, and maybe if he yeah. if that were the case, they don't go out and get a portal guy. Yeah, maybe he's the, maybe he's slaughtered over there. Who knows? Well, David, this has uh, been a lot of fun. I, I like talking about these freshmen because there's so much unknown. And what's interesting is we can take this podcast and listen to it in late February, and we'll see the areas where we just didn't know. We'll see some of the areas where we had an idea about guys, and they're going to change a lot in the next few months, which is going to be a lot of fun. I always like that about freshmen, because you get to know them after this in February and say, what a moron. Yeah, well, that's that's I was very very politely saying that about us, but yeah, but it's going to be interesting outside of Trimble to see how much nickel helps. Uh, when is there a game that Shaver needs to step up and give him 15, 12 minutes, something like that? How does he do? And at what point are they comfortable sort of unleashing Jalen Washington? When I say unleash, I'm not saying 25 minutes a game, but putting him into a game and he can go full throttle, ready to roll. You know, I'm that's- a big and I'm just still, we talked about the developer. I'm player developer. I'm a big uh, uh, believer in that. Tennessee had a big post from Kingsport right over on a, not far from the North Carolina line, not far from Appy State over there. But the big white kid that was uh, the center for them last year for Tennessee, you remember? He played, played five years there, right? Didn't he use a yeah. COVID year? Yeah. Kingsport. Nobody's a solid player. Him. Nobody outside of Kingsport had ever heard of him in, in Tennessee. Didn't know who he was. And he goes down there, and, and he's one of those guys that Rick Barnes brought in. And people were like, what in the world? And that was before there was a lot of Rick Barnes trust. That's when he was just building at Tennessee. Uh, people was like, man, he is just – he's torpe- torpedoing that program, bringing in guys. What's he doing? I heard that over and over and over. And, man, this guy's turned out to be really good for them. But it was just, it was every day and for, you know, month after month after month after month in there where the coach is putting in the work. And the next thing you know, you've got a player. So don't ever underestimate these guys getting to work with their coaches. And if they'll put put in the work and put their nose to the grindstone, what they can become. You talk about Fulkerson, right? Fulkerson. Yes. Yeah. John Fulkerson. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, you know, on that, before we sign off, I was doing my three things podcast the other night with uh, Brandon. I was doing it on Zoom and to my left, having a three point shooting contest where Ed Coda and Serge Wicker, they honored the 97 and 98 teams and Serge was a senior 98. He was actually a red shirt. In 93, when they won the national championship, he was a part of the program. 7-1, 7-2, Dean brought him in, red shirt him. Straight up redshirted him. And uh, Serge slowly developed and developed and got to the point where he was a really good player his senior year. And he actually earned a little bit of money in the league, didn't play too much, but I know the Rockets sent him, uh, gave him some checks. And that was, that was pretty good. And Serge made some money overseas. So uh, he did well for himself. And he was a perfect example. If you go back and watch that 97 team, the way Serge and Antoine Jameson played off each other was pretty impressive at times. He was great one night against Maryland. Actually, a sophomore year, Carolina fans remember, they, they were on verge of losing to Murray State in the first round down in Tallahassee. And Serge came, I think uh, Rasheed Wallace had the ankle problem and Serge came in and had a big, big game and, and they don't advance without Serge helping them out in that game. So he's another example of a dude, you bring in a big guy, you can't teach length, you can't teach size and you can't, you know, you really can't teach work ethic when it comes down to it. And if Will Shaver has that, we're talking about him and, and certainly the patience that Jalen Washington is going to have to have before he's ready to roll. That will help them out and will help Carolina basketball out uh, without a doubt down the road. Yeah. So like I said, it, and, and this, what we're talking about right now, we talked about late February. This may not be a late February deal. You may have to pull this video back, look on YouTube and it says two years ago underneath it and, and yeah. look at that. But like I said, it's developmental, but uh, it'll be interesting to see where these guys go. But I, I, I've got the feeling that you're going to have some uh, s- some some stories here that, that are going to be good ones that turned out better than, than, than many people expected. 
I agree with you on that. For David Sisk, I'm Andrew Jones. We appreciate you guys stopping by. Thanks.